I guess we'll get, can you hear me everyone? I guess we'll get started at 7.01, so we're a minute behind already. So welcome and thank you for coming to our Lynn Ward Graphic Novel Prize event. I'm Carla Schmidt, Director of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. It's really amazing that this is the 12th year of the Lynn Ward Prize, and we're pretty excited about that, that it's been this many years. I'd like to start out by acknowledging some important people who have made some contributions to the award. Faye Chadwell, the Dean of Penn State University Libraries and Scholarly Communications, has sponsored not only the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, but also this award. And Mihoko Hosoi and Betseda Reyes are administrators who are also are very supportive of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book. We'd like to thank the faculty and staff at the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, especially our outreach coordinator right here in the front row, Caroline Wormuth, who coordinates this award and event. And to James McCready over in this corner, who is um, taking care of all of our technical support tonight and also recording the event for us. We'd also like to thank the public relations and marketing team for their promotion of the prize and the event. And also, oops, to make sure I'm pushing the right things, we'd like to thank the Lynn Ward Graphic Novel Prize Advisory Board of who some are sitting here in the audience. I see John Meyer, Joel Pretty, uh, Clara Drummond, thank you so much for coming this evening. You've been, some of you since the very beginning, 12 years ago. I know John, did you, you served on the first committee, is that correct? So you've seen a lot of things happen in that amount of time. Um, we'd also like to recognize Robin Ward Savage and the late Nanda Whedon Ward for the don donation of Lynn Ward, who is their father, of his materials to the Penn State University Libraries. The award honors Mr. Ward's significant influence on the development of the graphic novel and celebrates the gift of an extensive collection of Ward's wood engravings, original book illustrations, and other graphic art materials donated by Robin and Nanda. After the presentation tonight, Lee is going to take questions. And uh, uh, Caroline and I will be walking around with microphones so that we would ask that you please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. And we'd ask that you please do wait for the microphone to come to you, um, especially for those of us that are hard of hearing. It does make a big, huge difference if you use that microphone. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Christopher Haney, the 2022 Linward Prize juror, who is going to present the award tonight. Thank you, Carla. On behalf of this year's award committee, I want to thank the Lynn Ward Prize's conveners for the opportunity to serve, and Caroline and Carla in particular. Award committees are always interesting. You get to read widely in a genre or field, and you come out of it feeling excited about the incredible work being done. The work of it can sometimes be hard, though, and I'm pleased to say that this wasn't the case for this year's prize. It was an absolute pleasure, and my four fellow committee members and I enjoyed ourselves from the beginning. There are phenomenal, phenomenal graphic novels uh, being made by artists and writers in the U.S. and Canada right now, and each of the jurors came to the table excited in different ways. The prize conveners did a great job of anticipating and balancing the, those excitements, and so we want to start by thanking them the conveners, and also to tell you just a little bit about ourselves. Our chair of this year's award committee was Carol Tilley. Carol Tilley is an associate professor in the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Cham Urbana-Champaign. In addition to teaching future librarians, she is a co comic scholar, a past president of the Comic Studies Society, and a judge for the 2015 Will Eisner Comics Industry Awards. Uh, Sophia Alexander is an undergraduate student at Penn State University, majoring in graphic design. Inspired by art and its many forms, she aspires to create a better world through design. Her attachment to graphic novels uh, is tied to her passions in art, and she hopes to publish a graphic novel of her own someday. 
I put them in alphabetical order, pardon me. Uh, Christopher Haney, me, uh, is an assistant professor of history at Penn State, uh, where I use graphic novels to teach students about historical sources. I'm a lifelong comics reader, and in the online history journal, The Appendix, I edited the Not So Funny Pages, an experiment in historical storytelling using comics. Uh, Dina Mahmoud is a PhD candidate in comparative literature and visual studies at Penn State University. Her research examines the reception of Arabophone, Francophone, and Anglophone comics on civil co conflicts from the Swana region. And Liz Shapelrai is a dual titled doctoral candidate in comparative literature and women's gender and sexuality studies at Penn State University. Their research and teaching focuses on focus on representations of queer community, queerness, and transness in graphic novels, comics, speculative fiction, novels, poetry, and poetry slam. Okay. Our interests were wide ranging, and we each brought favorites to the table. Uh, there were over 100 books, and there were many we loved for different reasons. What was striking, though, was how we as a group kept returning to a set of books that were nominated in our very first round of discussions. The three books that have received the Lynn Ward Prize and the Honor Book Recognition all share something in common. They're about the families we are born with and the families we make, lose, and find again along the way. Perhaps this was chance. Art as good as the works we had on the table had a long life of development before print. Uh, they were all started before the pandemic, and they were incredible works on their own. But reading these books together in the final months of 2021 and the beginning months of 2022 had a certain resonance. What they together reflected in that moment of loss and opening back up was our longing for distant loved ones who have known us longest, longest the sadness that we may have lost them, or that they might not know us as well anymore, as well as the desire to make or find beautiful art that can explain that gap. Our first honor book is How to Pick a Fight by Lara Kamenoff, published by Nobrow. What a fun book. In How to Pick a Fight, Lara Kamenoff's spunky and memorable characters take the page by storm. Kamenoff's main character, Jimmy Ruckus, loves watching wrestling with his grandma and dreams of life in the ring. The problem is that Jimmy's big, loud family has no space for his dreams. So he leaves to seek the amazing life he imagines. Fireworks ensue, and animals literally run riot. Kamenoff's combination of bold lines, brilliant reds, Chiascuro style, and energetic story explodes off the page and propels Jimmy and his exaggerated pompadour into readers' hearts. Unlike many coming-of-age stories in which the protagonist returns to the familiar, Kamenoff's story keeps propelling Jimmy forward, reminding us, no matter how impossible it seems, to climb towards our dreams. Our second honor book, is no one else. Oh, here we are. Would have helped for you to visualize what we were talking about. That's good to know. Um, How to Pick a Fight by Lara Kamenoff. Our second honor book is No One Else by R. Kakuo Johnson, published by Fantagraphics. In this slim, enigmatic graphic novel, a brother, sister, and her son must figure out how to be a family again after the death of an elderly father. Johnson's specificity and observation of daily life in Hawaii brings a point poignancy to that loss and its impact. Individual panels leave their mark, a work ID accidentally thrown in the garbage, a grandfather's ashes under the sink, a runaway cat, Maui's traffic lights, and backyard parties. Johnson's finely observed naturalism contrasts with expansive spreads filled with fierce, expressionistic oranges and thick blacks. These impactful images and eco economical text encourage readers to contemplate the question of what we might find within loss and what remains incomprehensible. Finally, the 22 Lindward Prize goes to Stonefruit by Lee Lai, who was born in Narm, Australia, and currently makes comics and illustrations in um, Teochiaje, Quebec. Her short story comics have been featured in The New Yorker, uh, The Lifted Brow, Room Magazine, and Everyday Feminism. And Stone Fruit, what I believe is her first book length graphic novel, was published by Fantagraphics. We are so thrilled to give the award to this book, which asks life, one of life's most essential questions. How is it that something so sweet, wonderful, and delicious is also filled with hardness? The answer animates Stone Fruit's empathetic exploration of love, intimacy, kinship, and care. It is the story of four women brought together by birth love and choice. 
Ray and Braun are together aunties to Nessie, a five-year-old filled with feral joy. But Nessie's mother, Amanda, only recognizes her sister's, his, her sister Ray's presence in their lives and resents Braun's spontaneous connection with Nessie. Braun, meanwhile, is torn by her family's difficulty accepting the woman she knows herself to be and her responsibilities to her own younger sister. This book spoke to us in so many ways. Um, I learned to be less jealous of my own cool younger sister, for example. Uh, but the timber of its art made clear how it could speak to others as well. Uh, several of us gave stone fruit as presidents for, the hol for holidays and birthdays last year. That art is something to celebrate. Lies nuanced character, nuanced character and question-driven graphic novel sparingly uses line, text, and color. But when Ray, Braun, and Nessie come together, the inks thicken and grow wild. These choices seem to bring a starkness to the story's two halves, but they also open spaces for readers to engage more deeply with the complexities around what family means. Dreamlike ink wash landscapes contrast with bodies that carry the marks of living and loving. Scenes of joyous monstrosity are foils for the traumas embedded in the lives of Braun, Ray, Amanda, and Nessie, who learn to reach beyond themselves to care for each other and explain what they need. They become something sometimes more flexible than family, more permanent than passion. They find the hard thing that outlasts sweetness, but that can be replanted to grow our sense of kin and make possible, um, and make possible future wonder. It's ultimately deeply hopeful. Lee Lies Stone Fruit is one of those rare graphic novels where everything, story, text, images, style, comes together in full complement to create a memorable, moving experience for readers. What a wonderful, wonderful book. Thank you, Lee Lai. We are so glad to have you with us today. And normally, there is a set of Lynn Ward's graphic novels or woodcuts that are handed over this point, but she's already received them, so. I got them twice, they're beautiful, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Is it better if I speak into this? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you everyone for having me here. It's very cool to be in Pennsylvania. Uh, my roommate in Montreal grew up here around here. So I've been very excited to tell her that I'm coming to this place that I thought I would never come to. There's a lot of places I've already been to that I thought I would never be because of comics, which still shocks me. Um, but anyway, thank you for coming tonight and thank you for this honor. It's, it, it's, it's amazing to hear my book talked about in this way. I didn't even think I was gonna get it published, um, which I think is a good attitude to continue to have, but it feels very, very celebratory to know that it's being um, read and that it's resonating for people, um, especially people who might not necessarily be able to relate directly to all the details of the story, but kind of take what they will from it. And I think the greatest treat so far has been listening to people's different interpretations, what they've taken from it, what they've projected onto it, that feels like an enormous treat. Um, maybe I take my mask off for this part and then I put it on for later because it probably is easier to hear what I'm saying. So I thought for the part where I just talked to you, um, I'm not great at monologuing. I can, <laughs> I'm a chatty person and I can if I need to, but I prefer having a chat. Um, so if people do have questions, I thought I would kind of format it a little different and try and race through the part where I'm just talking on my own and then be able to interact with you all a little more. So no pressure to ask questions. I'll probably drag my dear friend Tommy, who drove 10 hours yesterday from Providence to come hang out with me because we haven't been able to see each other. We've known each other for over a decade and we both come from Melbourne, but um, we haven't been able to see each other because of the border for a long time. And so this is like an exciting moment. And they're also a fabulous cartoonist who's published with Fanographics. And most of my relationship to my professional work comes from endless, endless, endless hours working together and also talking about our work and trying to find ways to make the work feel joyful and challenging at the same time. So if there's no questions, I'll probably just bully them into talking about comics with me because it's all we do anyway. Um, but yeah, I thought for this part of the talk, I would just talk about the back story of before the book because I think I think the publishing industry loves to just create this illusion that there's 
cartoonists just banging out books. Um, and graphic novels are actually just enormous amounts of labor. And most cartoonists I know are like broke and self-effacing and have other stuff to do and sometimes finish one in their lifetime. Um, and everything else around the work I find more interesting than the final product. Um, and so I, I thought I'd just look, show some old work actually, and like talk about my journey leading up to the book. And then if we want to talk about the book together in terms of questions, I thought that might be a good time to do that. Um, so I, the, here's just a random assortment of work that I was making before Stone Fruit, which was my first graphic novel and was an enormous learning curve. Um, I think it's full of errors, but I don't feel, <laughs> I don't feel regrets about that. Um, I finished art school in 2013 and art school was in Australia. It was one of those art schools where they want to form you into the kind of artist that does fancy installation type work generally. So I was very discouraged to do comics in school um, and therefore didn't draw for the three years that I was there. And so 2014 came and I found myself in a really cool little world of a lot of illustrators in, in Melbourne who were not working necessarily professionally, but just doing it for the pleasure. And it was a wonderful time of exploration. There was a lot of zine fairs happening in Melbourne. There's a big zine culture there, which means that you can share something at a very low stakes, sell it for $5 and just see what happens. Mostly nothing happens. Maybe you make $30 from the experience and then you put it in a can to make the next thing. Um, but I think that was a really great way to figure out not just the kind of style and stories I wanted to tell, but also just my relationship with sharing my work. Before then, it was always in a school context, which is a very particular kind of context. And most cartoonists, including me, have a very strange relationship to sharing. Uh, it's like a very strange compulsion, but at the same time, they detest the work that they're making and they're full of shame. And so it's just, it's interesting to see what kind of fuel is gained from sharing the work. I feel compelled to share it. It's, it's fascinating to me watching and hearing the feedback that I get from it. And it is incredibly motivating to do another thing. Um, but at other times I feel extremely exhausted with the fact that I'm, the goal is a constantly changing something I'm proud of one day becomes something I'm terribly ashamed of the day after. And sharing kind of create, is, is tied up with that in its own way. Um, but this was a really, 2014, 2015 particularly were really great times of just floating around and working in restaurants and drawing just to see what happened. It's the only time in my life I really did a sketchbook in a big way. I was doing a lot of portraiture, having a lot of conversations with people I'd never met before. This is my friend Pearl in a pizza restaurant. Um, I guess like a lot of cartoonists, I used to work in even more detail um, and it was fun to kind of pile on as much as I needed to to find the form and then slowly strip it away. Um, this is a piece from an anthology that um, our friend in Melbourne, Mark Pearson, who's also an excellent cartoonist, um, created. He's one of the many people that gave me my first deadlines um, and just gave me a reason to finish a project. And I think a great part of learning what my relationship was to sharing my work was having deadlines and just knowing that I had to put out something, even if I wanted to hide it away in the cave and wait until I was good enough for me, which actually doesn't exist. Um, and so he would have these anthologies where everyone would put in a thing. And so we we're all kind of being vulnerable together in that way. And it was really great. And we'd print it on a risograph printer and just see what happened. Um, my first experiences of tabling at big comics fairs was with Mark and Tommy and a few others. And it was very, over caffeinated and sweaty and exciting. Um, and we'd always walk back from those experiences feeling not necessarily proud of the work, but proud of the experience that we had gained and extremely motivated to do it again, which I think is the best I can expect from sharing my work and having that relationship. Um, I moved to Montreal in 2016 and it's I, I find it interesting how much geography does seem to be important for arts community and the art making itself. Um, there's a lot more people making comics in North America, it seems, than currently in Australia, even though Australia has its own very vibrant and interesting comics, cartooning, graphic novel, zine scene. Um, but when I moved here, it became more affordable to make the work. Um, 
it became more motivating in terms of the people that I was around. And I just started doing a lot of small, short comics and just seeing what happens. Um, I've done a few university talks now and the question that students always ask is like, how do I make a style? <laughs> um, how do I create a, a comic style? How do I create an illustration style? Um, and my answer is boring and exactly the same as all the other cartoonists who answer that question, which is just like draw a lot. And, and I think that drawing a lot, the process of just repeating and doing more experimentation a lot um, just allows one to find what their hand prefers to do, what they're naturally drawn towards, um, what kind of stories and what kind of dialogue, what kind of pacing, what kind of colors and line work. Um, and it was very fun to just have a lot of room to draw and see what I just enjoyed. And I think the thing that all of these earlier comics taught me is that I just love drawing people talking, <laughs> which <laughs> I'm convinced is very boring, but like the process of sharing has told me that enough people seem to enjoy reading that, that I should just continue doing it if it's something that I like to do. Um, it also was a really important time in terms of figuring out the line between fiction and personal experience. Um, I think I can relate to most of the work that I put out, like often the characters are somewhat similar to my experience or, or my family's experiences, but also have an important level of remove, which for me is important. I think there's amazing autobio cartoonists out there. I cannot do it. I am too cagey for that shit. Like, I, I, get, I become very disingenuous, I think, if I'm working for, directly from my own experiences. And so all these short comics were really great. Oh, that's just a picture of me and Tommy, because I thought I'd put it in there as a moment in time when um, we moved to Montreal together and it was a really important part of developing my work. Um, but yeah, all these short comics, just to figure out like what I was doing, um, what, what parts were, of my own experience were too vulnerable to share and what parts were the perfect level of uh, therapy for me and relatable for other people. Um, around 2016 was the first time I started exploring um, building characters in a more intentional way, intentionally building fictional characters and seeing what my responsibilities were to people that don't actually exist. Um, like what kind of stories I wanted to tell by building those characters, whether the story was just the character itself or whether they're gonna experience something together. Um, and I put out this little chat book type thing uh, called First Year, which is about the first year of these two boys in relationship with one another. And it wasn't very long. I think it was like a hundred pages, a panel a page, very, you could read it standing up at a zine fair without buying it. Um, and it was really great to just, give that a go, put it out and see what it was like for me to have an, a, a deeper acquaintanceship with a set of characters. And it turns out that that was the best. Like I loved it more than I've ever loved making short, short comics. I still make short comics and they serve a very particular purpose of their own, but there's something that feels so decadent and exciting to me about building a set of characters, collaging bits of myself, bits of, fully imaginary things, bits of questions that I want to ask and I want to resolve through the character and just getting to run with that for like a year or two years or three years. Um, it can be very boring as well, um, but I think I'm lucky enough to have a lot of friends who are big nerds about people as well, whether they're made up people or real people. And so talking about Eric and Ali with other friends as I wrote their stories out, little vignettes mostly, like uh, just them talking about their families to each other while eating a bowl of noodles or something like that. Um, but being able to soundboard that with friends and discuss them like they were real people. Um, I'm very proud to say that all my friends are insatiable gossips and me too. And so the chance to gossip about fictional characters with people who actually exist in my life was such a great way of getting to know them and then knowing what their motivations are. And then from there, figuring out if there was a story in particular that I wanted to share and why. Um, I have a, I think a healthy mistrust for myself in terms of my own motivations in storytelling and the decisions I make creatively. And it's really nice to also have friends in my life who I can talk about that with and talk about, yeah, the kind of content that I'm putting out, the kinds 
of people that I'm creating from scratch. It's weird to create a person from scratch <laughs> and decide, like, play God to these little Lego people and decide what's going to happen to them. Um, and I don't know how people do that in a solitary way, but we're all different. Um, and yeah, that led me finishing that project first year was uh, the kind of push I needed to to at least not feel capable of doing this. I felt felt completely in the woods for um, the start of this, but to at least know the pleasure of 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 exploring characters that deeply, to want to do it again, and to see what would happen if I did it over a set of thousands more panels than before. Um, Around this time, I took a screenwriting course, and so on the side, outside of this this, uh, this class, I was doing little vignettes as usual, just to get acquainted with the characters, see how they interacted with one another, um, play with the transmorphing thing that was happening, and see if that was something that would work in a in a longer story. Um, and then in the class, I was writing out a story structure and. At that point, I'd mostly done just chats between people, and so it was very confronting to try and just bang out a bunch of story beats one after the other and justify that as a story before I'd done all the frilly bits. Um, what was particularly noticeable to me was that it was in a classroom that was um, non-comics people. They were all just mostly younger than me, um, undergrad students learning screenwriting and interested in movies and wanting to write movie scripts for the most part and we were workshopping each other's work and so when they were reading this script in its earliest stages and just being like that's boring like I've really relied on drawing to trick people into thinking that the story is interesting and to like hide any weaknesses in the writing and like most cartoonists definitely not all but most cartoonists I know tend to feel more comfortable with the drawing side than the writing side um, and so it was absolutely humiliating and really formative to submit the first drafts of this script to a bunch of very judgmental young people um, and just get the feedback that was not designed at all to protect my feelings and um, help have help from them and from the prof to figure out what was going to happen in the story. And at that time, I was just doing other illustration work. Um, and so I just got to sit on this script for a year just as a script, which I've never allowed myself to do before because because of freelancing responsibilities and, and work and money, but also just because of my own impatience. Um, and so I just worked on it as a script for about a year on and off and then started giving it a go as a drawing it out as a comic. Um, around this time, I wasn't just getting feedback from those screenwriting kids, but also starting to hand it to friends and ask them what they thought. In the initial version of the story, I never knew what happened to Bron. She went away, the, the breakup happened, she went away, and then it just followed Ray for two chapters before Bron gets pulled back in. And I gave the first two chapters to my friend Eli and told them what I planned for that. And they just told me, no, that's boring. Like, I need to know what's happening to all the characters. I'm gonna, you're gonna establish investment from the start, you've got to follow through. Um, that those soundboarding opportunities were essential to how I understand the characters today. Um, early on, I think I was having a conversation with you, Tommy, about Amanda. And at the start, she was just an antagonist. Like I just was having her there to be another conflict, another push in the story. And Tommy and I were talking about the jealousy that she must feel as this overworked mum when there's this person outside of the family coming in and just getting to be the fun magical guy and um the resentment that she will feel and like the chance even though she wasn't the main character that's not not something I'd really thought about as a function of a side character um and she ended up being pretty much my favorite character to write um and her and her relationship with Ray turned into like one of the great pleasures of refining the script and just figuring out what their relationship arc was going to be in the book um, and so like those chats were the most exciting thing that was such an exciting and <laughs> terrifying time of wrestling with like big blank spaces in the script where I didn't know how to resolve something and trying to decide whether I knew a character well enough to have them arrive at a certain plot point. Um, long form is so thrilling for that. Um, and then it, here's just some pencils. I think I'm approaching the end now, but uh, 
everything's done pretty traditional, like pencils on Bristol, um, and then gouache and then ink. Um, there's something really pleasurable about doing comics because it's just so slow and so labor intensive and it slows me down, which is a really nice thing. So I can use the time in which I'm drawing to be making decisions about the writing um, and probably vice versa as well. Um, I think most people I know uh, who are cartoonists are very, very uh, dedicated to that like slowness and that labor intensity. I, I find the same things in animators who, yeah, want to pour their sweat into 24 frames for every second of film. Um, and I think that, at least in my experience of reading comics, I think that creates a certain kind of density in, in reading them that is really, really pleasurable. Um, but yes, this, this project in total spanned about three to four years. And a lot of that was just reworking things. Like I tend to work relatively quickly once I know what I want to do. Um, but a lot of it was just wandering around, not being sure and talking about it a lot and trying to make decisions. And maybe on the, in retrospect, I'm romanticizing it a little bit. I think it's more fun than it actually was at the time. I'm in the midst of another one now and it's a real pain in the ass. Um, but I'm sure in like two years, I'll say it was really fun. Um, but I think I'm getting to enjoy the fun bit now, which is knowing that it's out in the world and simultaneously being absolutely horrified by that and also being so honored that people want to spend time with it and have their own thoughts about it and uh, giving me perspectives on it that I'd never even thought about before. Um, and I think I experienced that in some ways with the sharing of zines and things like that, but it's kind of taken it to a next level with longer stories and just makes me feel so much more enamored with storytelling than I think I ever have before. So maybe I'll just end on saying thank you. Like it's just such a pleasure to to know that it's it's that that sharing it had a point <laughs> and and that I'll have more motivation to keep going in the future. Um, I'm going to pull this thing out and then if anyone wants to ask questions, you're very welcome to do it. Maybe I'll sit down for this part. Caroline and I are taking each side of the room. So if you have a question, oh, you do right next to me. Hi, uh, I really, really admired, I love this scene, um, but you say, Anna, I swear I read this book. I'm bad with oh, remembers yeah, characters. Yeah, me name. Too, I'm bad um, <laughs> the sister, the mother. Amanda, yeah. Um, I really admired how you say she started off as an antagonist and perhaps similarly you had that in mind with Bronze family um but you don't at least I did not um interpret a very negative outcome I feel like you portrayed a yes there is hurt there is damage there's perhaps a bridge a chasm even um but you promote the rebuilding and even though that is hard and painful so my question is just um it's very general but if you just would care to comment on like the idea of that cutting off and just separating versus the payoff between like recognizing the harm done and rebuilding those connections rebuilding those uh bridges mm -hmm just any yeah. comments you have. On it's really that. nice. Thank you. Um, I well, okay, I'm 29. I'm nearly 30. I'm 30 on January. And it's funny, because I'm in a, a class right now with a bunch of adult learners who are doing a government French class, and everyone thinks I'm 16. Um, but in in terms of that timeline for my outlook on the relationships in my life, especially with my family, um, I came out as queer quite young I think like 14 15 and and then trans and my family's really great but like struggle with it because it's confronting like for most people coming out in that context they are the first queer or trans person that their family's ever meeting and at that point their parents are particularly or anyone in their extended family are, are like in the 50s 60s 40s like it's a long time to think that the world's one way and then actually it's another way in the form of this person that you have so much expectation of and all the things and 
when I was younger, um, it was there was an important period for me of of being very staunch and doing a lot of separation and like reestablishing myself, asserting my autonomy, going into the world, deciding X Y Z things about my identity. And then as I entered my mid twenties, I started second guessing all of it, <laughs> making a lot of errors in my own like uh, attempted adult life. And also just reflecting on my relationship with my family more and realizing that I can't be that staunch about the people that I've built these long lasting, incredibly complex relationships. Um, it made sense to me that Amanda's not an antagonist because no one in my life is just an antagonist. And that doesn't mean they can't act like rubbish <laughs> and people can be really, really unpleasant to each other. But um, I think I am not interested in those kinds of stories as much because I just don't encounter those kinds of people in the people I'm having relationships with. Like I can encounter people like that in the media, but those are not the kinds of stories that I'm interested in telling. I like stuff that is closer to home. Um, and so I guess that whole thing of like, I'm not looking to create antagonists or villains in general in my life. Um, and that doesn't serve me. That hasn't served me well. It served a purpose. And I think I was trying to reference that in the book in terms of the past that is alluded to, but not shown in terms of Ron, Ron and Bron and Ray um, building their relationship with a certain kind of foundation and asserting their autonomy and the safeness of that space. And then that kind of troubling as the years go by. Um, but I think at the time that I was writing it, I was also arriving at a point where that was more interesting to me um, to look at the complexity of why the relationships are so hard, but not necessarily any kind of concrete answers about whose fault it is <laughs> or who's a bad person in the situation um, or who's the antagonist because like at least in my life no one was and that's why it was so damn confusing um, because it's a lot easier when someone is <laughs> yeah Hi, uh, you mentioned that uh, well, comics are a slow process and that, that the process of working on a comics page really slows you down. For uh, a book like this where you have the whole thing scripted out and then you've got these long, long days of working on one page after another, did your relationship to the story change and shift as you're just sort of working out these pages? And if so, did that did you have any difficulty sort of keeping it conforming with your script? And then the second part is, since you're working on a book now, has your process shifted in terms of having a full script and so on with the new book? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll start with the first part. Um, it changed a lot, yeah. Um, it changed faster than I could keep up with in the drawing process. And I think it changed so much because I was talking about it so much um, with other people and having input coming in from the outside, like in the acknowledgements page, there's a big, big list of people. Um, and some of them were directly involved in editing the book. And some of them were just people I was hanging out with and having extremely interesting conversations with that were changing my worldview in general, um, which continues to happen. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge that in the back of the book. But um, I think the the two pronged answer is that the script kept changing and so I'd have to go back in and change it and then I added in a lot of scenes and it was very helpful to do the script writing course and see the book as not a chronological set of events even though it is uh, written somewhat chronologically but just to understand it as these chunks that can be shifted and moved around and like something else can be spliced in between um, rather than you know I start at point a and I edit end at point z um, to just see it all as a bunch of blocks. And so in that respect, that's that's one part of the process that I've carried into this next book, um, writing things in beats and writing things in chunks and like knowing that a certain scene will be, that I want that scene, I like it, it does something that I want it to do. And so I'll start drawing that out, um, but another scene will be fully unrealized. And so I'll just put it to the side. Um, I have a lot of writers who don't do comics as well in my life and I have no idea how they function because they just have to be making those kinds of executive decisions every day. Um, I find that appalling. I, I, I think I'd be just passing out from 
exhaustion every day if that was my process every day. It's so much mental energy to be making big decisions about characters and stories all the time. It's thrilling, but it's so much energy. And to be able to do it until I hit a point of resistance and then put it down for a second, talk about it, think about it, draw entirely in that time um, and use that time as borrowed time. I think in the past, I liked drawing more than I liked writing. And so it was kind of a point of discipline to be like, come back. <laughs> Don't just put it down forever and then realize you've drawn all the pages that you scripted and be f fiddling around the blank space after that. Um, but this, the process has changed somewhat for this, this book around um, because I'm just working at a faster pace now than I used to. Um, I also have a publisher now who wants the next one apparently. So I just, it's different to the first one, which I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing it to see what it would be like. Um, and so this one, I've started drawing a lot earlier. And as a result, I've trashed like 50 or more pages because I'm drawing it. And then I realized that actually something's not working in that and I have to let it go. Um, but I'm not particularly precious about my work in that way. And I see it as practice. Um, and it's, it's as difficult to learn how to draw a character repetitively hundreds of times throughout a book as it is to figure out what their motivations are and the decisions they're going to make and their dialogue style and all those things. So I think it is helpful in the process of building a character to also be drawing it several times, drawing their face on different angles, different expressions, different gestures and their body language, um, and then look back on 70 pages ago and realize that they've changed and that the new version is more accurate. And so I'll go back and draw the old version again. Um, and it's as long as I can financially handle the rig, the constant reworking and like can buy myself that time, I will take it because it's such a pleasure to rework. Um, I think a lot of people have described the pleasure of editing their own work and how conducive it can be to, to writing more complex or interesting stories to themselves to have something already there and then rework something rather than pulling it out of thin air. And I try and not expect that um, once it's penciled or once it's inked, that that's it. And just see it as another chance to change it if it needs to be changed. Um, because that allows me the freedom to continue working with without the fear of error. Because the errors happen. <laughs> they just have to happen. I just have a follow up to that because in your introduction, Chris had spoken about the shift in your palette and, and brush strokes. And so I'm curious with this process that goes back and goes back again, if you were cognizant of that, if that was a conscious decision or if that was just something that emerged through the process. I think both. Um, there was definitely aspects of it that were intentional in terms of uh, the play scenes where they do turn into weird animals um, would there deliberately to challenge me like I've never done that kind of fantasy element before um, and I was really struggling with it uh, mostly I do realism and that's been the point of comfort for me and so that was there to just see if I could loosen up my style a bit and just see what would happen with my hand if I did um, I found it hard I felt like I made a lot of mistakes um, and then also as I just kept drawing, they, the, the drawing itself got easier. And so I could go back and, and re-edit. And um, I was still rewriting scenes all the time at that stage. And so the drawing, especially with those play scenes, were helping me figure out other things. I think there's a scene where um, Bron, it's kind of, we're realizing that Bron is a little more dependent on those times than we thought in terms of her own uh, levity from like, chance of a break from her terrible mental health and she gets kind of angry while she's still in that play mode and freaks Nessie out and I think at the at the first few times I was drawing those those monstrous scenes um it kind of occurred to me that she was like that they are kind of scary and there is kind of an edgy element to that play um and I think that drawing that and and thinking about that and looking at it in retrospect um allowed me to go back in and write that scene as one of the moments that becomes the catalyst for them splitting properly. Um, because it initially 
I think I just started with them doomed to break up, but not necessarily knowing all the pieces as to why and all the different pressures that were coming in on them. Um, and so the drawing did help me kind of make decisions about the narrative as well. Also, I, I changed so much in the way that I drew them from the beginning of the book to the end of the book that I had to go in and cut a bunch of their faces out on Photoshop and like stick them on the on the bodies of the earlier characters because they're unrecognizable in the in the original pages. Um, so I think that's a good hack. If anyone doesn't feel like they want to redraw like a bunch of characters 50 more times than they have to. Um, so thank you so much for this wonderful graphic novel. I was on the jury and I also assigned it to my students this semester and I think they really liked it. Yeah. Um, I was really interested in trans representation in this um, graphic novel, particularly because for me as a reader, even as one who is like a trans reader coming to it, I didn't realize bronze transness until uh, uh, Ray mentions like, but they don't even use your right name. And then that's the moment when I was like, oh, shoot, there's something else happening here. Um, so I was wondering what you were thinking about when you came to Braun as a character, how you wanted to represent her visually and through dialogue and what clues you wanted to give your readers to her transness um, and how you approach that just in general. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think I just wanted more characters who are trans and the story is not about that. Like it's not not about that for sure. I think it does inform it, at least to me in my understanding of when I, when I was writing it. Um, but the story is not about a trans person going through their transition and coming out and doing the, those things. And most of the stories about that have trans people in them that I have read or films or whatever um, have been about that. There's usually a body in, in the mirror scene where they're like trying on different clothes or looking at their binder or whatever. Um, and I think those stories have their place. They were important for me at times, but that's not very interesting to me as a trans person now at this point in my life. Um, I don't really have, I don't think about my identity in those ways. <laughs> I don't muse in front of the mirror and I don't really talk about it with my friends in that way either. Uh, it doesn't affect my relationships in that way, probably in many other ways. Um, and because I wanted to be writing queer characters and trans characters who weren't at the beginning of that queerness, um, who aren't, you know, coming out necessarily, but just kind of doing it. Um, it was important to me that it's not super established super early. This is kind of a guess also, because I can't honestly remember all of my motivations from back then, but there's another thing where, and this is just my own habits in, in terms of my coping strategies for being trans. Um, but I've worked in kitchens like for a long time. I haven't, don't do it anymore, but I miss it all the time actually. But one of my things for going into a lot of kitchen environments and like getting to know all my workmates, and it's like usually a lot of bros. Um, and like, Sometimes I passed, sometimes I didn't pass. It was kind of confusing. But my strategy, which definitely does not work for everybody, was to go in, not out myself at all, see if I could get away with being read as whatever they read me as, would just go with that for as long as possible, like a week or several months, and then come out. Because it is like, I do like coming out if I think it's going to be safe. It does feel nice to be able to be honest and open about myself in that way. It feels more comfortable than trying to do stealth forever. But it felt really spacious and nice to try and build relationships with the people before I came out, especially if I thought that I might be there first. And usually I was. And so it was really great to be known as the chatty Australian who's good at cutting spring onions, who hates X, Y, Z thing, who has this other story that they've told, who has this running joke with this guy, like before I came out. And so by then they wouldn't, just be kind of looking at me thinking about the fact that I was trans all the time, which definitely happens <laughs> if I'm out from the get-go to someone who's not familiar with that identity. And I think, I think I was kind of hoping for the same trick with Bron and maybe it's a dirty trick. I don't know, but like it was, I thought it was important to try and humanize the character without giving a tell straight away. And I think particularly with comics, there is a level of space that you're afforded depending on your drawing style, 
where you don't have to be super clear about it unless you really want to. Um, also, like trans people aren't always that obvious anyway. Like gender is fake. <laughs> and like I'm being surprised all the time in terms of my own biases for how I read people's bodies or how people read my body. And it's nice to be surprised, I think. I think the element of surprise creates its own kind of internal questioning. Um, and so to me, it was important to not focus on that. And I think there is tells in terms of the way I drew Bronn as a character, but also I think I tend to draw relatively androgynous characters often, which probably shouldn't be a surprise to me to myself at this point in the game. <laughs> We have time for a few more. So I have a selfish question as a librarian. What impact have libraries had on your life and like through your uh, creation of comics? That's a good question. Um, well, I think particularly with comics, most of the comics I've read are from libraries because they're expensive. <laughs> and like either I borrowed them from friends, but often I got them from libraries and I was lucky to grow up in Melbourne where there is a lot of graphic novels. They're not necessarily from Australians, which is unfortunate because there is a lot of really great Australians doing comics. Um, but I read some of the most important graphic novels, even in high school, like Mouse, Skim by the Mariko cousins, uh, by the Tamaki cousins. Um, uh, Blankets by Craig Thompson. Um, Palestine by Joe Sacco, like all the ones that were probably like $45 in the Australian bookstore and I never would have touched. <laughs> and so it was really nice to be able to go home and flop on my bed with this book that is so big generally and heavy and beautiful um, and get to go into it in that way. I was always very shy when I was younger, so I honestly did not talk to many of the librarians, which I probably missed out because librarians are so fun to talk about books with. Um, but I think just having that accessibility factor was really, really, really special for my exploration of comics specifically. Um, my main relationship with libraries when I was younger as a child was um, being a terrible reader. Like I loved stories. I was obsessed with stories, but I'm not a good reader. I just can't manage to get from one point to the other point in a page at a reasonable time frame. Very, very slow. And so my main way of getting the stories was uh, audiobooks. And I have probably spent years of my life accumulatively listening to audiobooks and listening to the same ones again and again. And um, me and my sister, who also has the same problem, would go with my mom with a giant tote bag and just take every cassette tape. They were giant cassette tapes at the time. They're no longer. It's like all on the app, <laughs> which is really convenient. Um, but we'd just have a huge, huge grocery bag full of cassette tape audiobooks and then just do other things while we were listening to them, like crafts or whatever. And I still, that's still a huge part of my process now. I do all my inking to audiobooks. Um, and it's fun because it means that for a while afterwards, if I'm looking at a certain panels, I can remember the point in the story that I was at in a certain book looking but there's like an image association which is such a pleasure there's like nothing that's more soothing in the world than inking pre-drawn lines and listening to a really good story um i think it made every aspect of consuming stories accessible to have libraries um and i'm still very grateful for those spaces i use them all the time there's a really great library in montreal called the bon Q or the grand bibliothèque and it's got a huge graphic novel collection. Um, it's got a huge audiobook collection. I've shared my audiobook login details with so many people outside of Montreal. Um, and I think having folks who are working there who just endlessly know so much about the catalog as well is so exciting because otherwise it's quite overwhelming. Um, and having it being a workspace has also been really great. It's something I've missed enormously in COVID that we just hang out in libraries less generally. Um, 
they've been such a great free workspace. And I think specifically a lot of cartoonists, less now that I'm older and my body hurts more, I need to work at one of those desks that goes up. But especially when I was younger, um, not needing to rent a studio and just being able to take comics, which can generally be drawn in a lot of places um, to a library table in a university that I don't, that I don't go to or you know, a state library um, and just being able to draw somewhere else, especially somewhere else that's surrounded by books and other people who are being studious uh, was really, really cool. Um, so I feel pretty nerdy about libraries. <laughs> we love hearing that. <laughs> I have a question. When you talk about having a conversation or a discussion with others about your characters or about what's happening in the story, that does the dialogue itself generate new ideas or are sometimes those discussions, do they get contentious in any way? Or, I mean, are there disagreements about character when you're talking with someone else about them or are your friends really in, and, and I, I would imagine, I don't know if editors look at graphic novels, but you know, I would think of them as being maybe more critical at times. So I'm just, I'm kind of curious about how, how that works in your process. My friends are definitely more critical than my experience of editing professionally. Um, I think at least in the graphic, like an alternative graphic novel world, and maybe I'm super wrong about this, but the, my impression is that editors are quite hands-off actually. Um, they tend to just point out all your grammatical mistakes and then call it a day. And maybe that's not true for other people's work, but it's been my experience so far. Um, Whereas my friends, um, most of the people I ask for feedback from are not tricked by art. So like they're not tricked by pictures. Uh, they tell me when the work is weak, <laughs> regardless of how many tricks I have tried to pull to convince someone otherwise. And that's really, really helpful. Uh, they generally, we generally hopefully have a secure enough connection that they're not worried about hurting my feelings. So it sounds like a safe space in a way. To be Definitely. able to be, yeah. Yeah. Um, that made me think of something else. Does the editor make any comments about the art at all? Or is it mainly looking at the grammatical, the words? My editor didn't. And huh. this is my first book, so I don't know. Like maybe he'll have stuff to say about the next one. Um, the main person who edits the art is Tommy, actually. Oh. Because <laughs> they're also an excellent cartoonist and they can tell, they've seen my work change over, yeah, the since we've met each other over a decade ago. And so I think they can tell when I'm taking the wrong shortcuts or if something's just not working in terms of the visual um, storytelling that's supposed to be happening, or if it's just boring, like I'm just repeating the same drawing too much or there's not enough dynamism or there's too much dynamism. Um, our work is very different aesthetically, but I think we probably enjoy similar things in terms of the books that we read. We're both kind of snobbish and bitchy while also enjoying a large range of things and so it's really fun to talk about other people's work critically and then learn from that experience too um yeah I don't know I think like I generally want spicy feedback it's very helpful for me but there are times in the process where I can't handle that I'm too right. insecure too confused about the story need encouragement and if I'm explicitly looking for encouragement I think I'm comfortable enough to ask for it for at least a certain few people um and if I want like if I'm secure enough and steady enough in the story to get anything like heavier as 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 far as criticism goes I can ask for that too which is feels really abundant to have that thank you I also have kind of a quirky question one of the slides showed I think it was a mother and daughter and they're talking about fashion yeah. and it's the mother who says something about, I didn't think flares would ever come back. I have no clue what flares are and I don't know, maybe the rest of you do, but I, I have no idea. What are they? Like, oh, bell bottoms. Like bell bottom. Maybe it's an Australian term. So is term? that an Australian term? Maybe. I don't know. I'm constantly shocked by what's an Australian term. I <laughs> regularly open my mouth and no one knows what I'm saying. <laughs> in this continent <laughs> so i've changed a lot of my words since i moved here um i actually wanted to ask a question about that related to like place and geography um this is a really interesting um wonderful set of panels to 
uh, have up because it focuses so much on on um, on the two of them and the room that they're in. But one of the things that's so lovely about the book is that um, I can sort of call up Amanda's couch in, in my head and Nessie and Bron's bed, and also where where they play together as a trio. Um, the geographies that you built into the book, they're also it's non-identifiable in some ways. It's never, nobody ever says, oh, here we are walking through Melbourne or <laughs> here we are walking through through Montreal. Um, but I, uh, is, is that similar to um, your answer to, to Liz in terms of not wanting to have things that people bring a baggage to? Um, and on the flip side of it, are you nonetheless write, writing and drawing with a specific geography in mind that lets it feel inhabited when you're working on it? Um, it's technically set in Montreal, but I cheated in all sorts of ways because it's also set over winter or at least a winter-ish period. And winter in Montreal is no joke. Like it's like there's like feet and feet of snow and, and, and mud and ice. And that was not happening in the story. And it couldn't work with the story in terms of the outside scenes to have that level of intensity of winter. And so I just faked it. And, uh, just made it what I wanted to because I could. And I don't want to try that again. I think that was really helpful in terms of already feeling like with this project, I'd bitten off a little more than I could chew. Um, and I just wasn't, I don't think I was experienced enough at the time to try and tackle all the other elements that come to the table when you're handling a really specific geography. I think just in terms of creating an atmosphere, living in Montreal and using scenes from my neighborhood and the neighboring neighborhoods uh, were very helpful. And there are, you know, all sorts of like, you know, I'd go to different class neighborhoods to, to take us to Bronze family home um, and that kind of thing. And just having references was really helpful for me because it is hard to conjure place completely out of your head. Um, but at the time, I didn't feel experienced enough to deal with the, what would come into the narrative if I made it a specific place. And I think, I think it shows in the in the dialogue as well. I think they speak like Australians, but they live in Canada, and so that was like a challenge to me. To in this project now that I'm working on, it is specifically set in Montreal, and it is amazing how many problems comes up as a result of that just in terms of the culture that is created by it being a bilingual city it's like a french and english city and the the, the colonial history there has really influenced the, the way that people relate to each other now and the way that the culture has formed um the geography of you know who what where anglophones live in the rural areas and what they bring to Montreal as a urban set center in terms of the scarcity of being a of, of being an anglophone living in the eastern townships when everyone else speaks French versus I don't know the class resentment of the francophones on the anglophones who were historically more wealthy and now are like less wealthy demographically like all those things have only become apparent to me in more detail enough to be able to start even prodding at using that in a story now that I've been living in Montreal for seven years and met more people who grew up there and just understand the history of the recent history of the city better. Um, and so now coming off the experiences of this book, I'm more interested in the challenge of putting it, putting the setting as a character in itself, or at least allowing it to influence the story more than I think this one did. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you work in sort of the traditional method of starting with pencils, moving to inks, but which, I mean, that in and of itself is increasingly rare as the digital tools become more flexible and so on. But you're not just working in those, you're working in gouache, which is delicate and finicky and fights you when you're, if you're trying to work with ink also, right? So clearly you like the physicality of making the page, right? Could you could you talk about sort of why you're drawn to these particular materials or this process? It's interesting that you said gouache is so tricky because I really always kind of went into it with the approach that it's it's quick and easy. And, you know, you can put it on, unlike acrylics, you can put it on your little ceramic plate as a palette or whatever you use and let it dry 
let it dry on your brushes even, and it's just fine. You just put some more water on it and it just immediately reactivates. Um, it's quite forgiving in terms of its high opacity. So you can kind of layer it and make mistakes and then do it again. Whereas watercolors, you've ruined the page. If you do it once and you fuck it up, you, you ruin the page. Um, and so I think in my uncertainties about different aspects of using brushes at all, I enjoyed the, for the forgiving element of gouache. But you're right, it doesn't interact well with uh, lines that are done in Speedball ink. Um, it creates a slightly chalky dry surface that doesn't actually interact that well at all. Um, and it's really hard to edit once it's scanned in because they just create really different contrasts with the white of the page. Um, and all those were things that I discovered <laughs> as challenges, but it was too late, too late into the process. Um, but I think I enjoyed gouache being something that was easy to push around the page and be a bit looser in because I think at the time probably still one of the main things I that was challenging me in drawing was just how tight things get and gouache I could use really cheap kind of big brushes and push the backgrounds around and be deliberately rough uh, some of my earlier experiments with short comics I do both of them on different layers so I do the, gou the gouache layer really scrappy and then I would do tracing paper over the top and do all my ink work on tracing paper, kind of like they did in an early animations, these watercolor backgrounds and then these cells on top with the moving characters. Um, that just was too much work and was really helpful as an educational experience, but uh, I don't think I'll do it again. <laughs> it's it's messy, yeah, it's, it's messy and difficult. I still love working on paper. There's a friction and, uh, a chance, high chance of error and all those things that I find really thrilling um, because that's where I get my kicks apparently. Um, and, you know, like erasing the, the the pencil line once you've done the ink line and then just having this clean drawing is just so good. And I think I've talked to digital artists about the pleasures that they have from digital drawing, which I cannot relate to at all, but it's really cool to just hear what whoever like what people are getting pleasure in, in the drawing process. And I think as long as there is a pleasurable element, great, then we can keep doing it. Um, and I think there's just a tactile pleasure in, in traditional media for me that as long as I experience that, I'm gonna stick with it, even if it's very out of fashion right now, because it really is. Um, because I think if I'm not enjoying the work, I'm just gonna be quite slow and frustrated. And it's just too many hours a day of drawing to wanna pick a medium that I don't like. Um, which is my main motivation. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Oh, we have another question. Oh my gosh. All right. I really enjoyed how deep your characters were and it kind of felt like we were just looking into one aspect of these characters and like the characters have like a life way before it be like, zoom into their story like way after. So I'm kind of interested, um, but it still feels like everything ties together so well. So I'm interested on like, do you think of these characters first and like what their motivations are? Or are you more inspired by like the overall message when you're coming to like a work or like a story? Thank you. Definitely not the message, because I don't know what it is. Uh, I think I'm in trouble for myself. The way I build characters and stories, I think I'd be in trouble if I had a message. Like, I have my own opinions, <laughs> and sometimes I like to be a soapbox guy and do that. But for the most part, I don't want there to be a message. I love hearing what other people think and just fiddling around with the characters themselves. Um, I think part of the way I've enjoyed writing characters is having... Oh, God, I hope that person's okay. <laughs> Um, having a lot of context that hasn't happened in the story, but is alluded to and trying to figure out how to show that in their dialogue and in the ways that they relate to each other without that being the point of the story either. Um, that's something I'm really enjoying in the project I'm working on now because the characters, we're finding them at the point in the story where they've been friends for like 10 to 15 years and it's getting a bit stale and weird but they're also deeply, deeply familiar with each other and have gone through a lot together and very loyal to each other. And so it's a fun challenge for me to try and figure out how to efficiently as possible, ideally for my own hours of drawing, um, show, convey that 
in the way that they relate to each other now because it's I think it's a pleasure reading stories where there's lots of context that's happened before the main event takes place um just in terms of the juice you know thank you <laughs> um we'd like to thank everyone who came this evening we're so happy that you came out in this cold weather and bacon from the penn state bookstore is here with copies of stone fruit if you'd like to have your own and uh lee will be autographing books and um we'll continue the conversation thank you so much